addressing smoking cessation utilizing psilocybin. And, and what we're showing in the efficacy rates that are coming out of that study are over three to five X what's currently available of you know, Chantix or um, a nicotine patch which are, with a much safer drug. It's a much more effective drug. When you look at the addressable market, it's projected to be 64 and a half billion by 2026, right? So that report gave us 0.5% of the overall addressable market, right? So, you know, given the upside potential of one of our drugs being successful, you're looking at a multiple dollar stock, right? At bare minimum, these are blockbuster drug potentials. My next guest is Josh Bart. He's the CEO and chairman of Midasin Innovations Group, trades on the NEO exchange under the symbol MYCO and in the United States under the symbol MYCOF. Josh, welcome. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Josh, it's great to have you here. Josh, let's start with an overview. What is the business of Midasin? Sure. So Midasin Innovations Group uh, is a biotechnology and digital technology company uh, looking to treat addiction and, and different mental health uh, disorders, more specifically PTSD, utilizing a variety of different uh, psychedelic molecules. Um, additionally, we have a, a digital health and, and digital therapeutics platform by the name of MindLeap Health. Okay, and so then are you in the business of uh, supplying pharmaceutical medicines to patients of PTSD? So not currently, we're a clinical stage um, biotechnology company. So. Um, we're currently in a phase 2A clinical study for PTSD, uh, utilizing psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy. And we have several second-generation novel molecules as well um, that are essentially improvements on the first generation of molecule. I see. And so at this point, is there a revenue stream for the company or are you sort of in the development stage? So for the most part, we're in the development stage. With that being said, we do have um, our technology platform, MindLeap Health, which you know offers a significant short-term revenue potential. Um, it's a subscription model as well as um, a percentage base on um, actually facilitating HD telehealth um, psychedelic integration meetings between accredited therapists and um, different patients, whether those are patients attending ketamine clinics globally or um, attending you know retreats or different uh, you know synthesis retreats etc depending on where they are in the globe we can supply and have over 135 trained and accredited professionals specifically trained in psychedelic integration both pre uh, pre and post that are actively on the application using and interacting with patients I see. And are mental health professionals at this point prescribing psychedelic molecules for treatment of PTSD? Um, you know, off-label, there's ketamine use, um, but that, that's really it. So, you know, the vast majority of, and it's important to also note that there's not a single pharmaceutical drug in or outside of psychedelic medicine that's actually manufactured for PTSD. So at this point, it's all off-label use for PTSD, which is you know a ridiculous statement, but it's unfortunately true. Um, but there is off-label use of ketamine currently being used for PTSD, and then obviously you know MAPS with their MDMA treatment currently in phase three is showing very successful results, upwards of 67% remission on. Um, on PTSD patients as well. So we believe, you know, true psychedelic medicine being MDMA, that that will be the first to, to come to market via MAPS. Mm -hmm. I've had some uh, exposure to MDMA and uh, it certainly, I like to think, was a uh, preventative effect towards anything like PTSD, depression. In fact, I credit my sunny disposition generally with a healthy exposure to all of the psychedelics as a youngster. Um, but what is the scientific sort of effect of the psilocybin or the MDMA molecules on the brain that causes PTSD trauma to be ameliorated? Sure. So there's, there's two different interactions. One is a serotonin releasing agent and one is a serotonin agonist. And they act in different ways, um, but, you know, we think have similar outcomes. With that being said, we also have... Um, a Myco003 product, which is a combination of the two um, in very specific ratios. 
Um, now, with that being said, so MDMA, the effects and kind of treatment protocols of MDMA is what's happening in the therapeutic setting or a therapy setting. It's, it's allowing the patient to be more open, more receptive, feel more comfortable to talk about deep-rooted trauma openly. And in many cases, you know, that's a suppressed trauma or a suppressed incident that now they feel okay and comfortable talking about in that therapeutic setting. Mm. And what's happening is when they're able to actually openly discuss that with their therapist, you know, you're seeing huge and highly successful results because you're actually dealing with the underlying problem at the core of the problem. What you're seeing in psilocybin is during the actual acute phase or the actual interaction with the drug, you know, in many cases, your, your eyes are covered. You're not really interacting or speaking that much with the therapist, but you're having this deeply introspective event where you're looking and viewing whatever the situation was that caused your, your PTSD in hopefully a different light. And then after the event, you have neuroplasticity taking, uh, taking place where you have you know, new brain waves and new um, you know, different synopsis connecting where you're able to kind of tailor that, look at that um, experience and whatever the, the root of your problem in a different light, change the perception on that and actually rewire your brain kind of in perpetuity so you're able to, to live a, a much healthier life moving forward. So different approaches. But both, you know, highly, highly effective for sure in, in the therapy setting. Yeah. Wow. So that's what happened. I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I wonder. You know, it's really interesting to me that the the taboo has come off of all of these formerly Schedule One drugs, and they're making their way into the mainstream. But how soon do you think until the prescription of psychedelic molecules is? Is normal. I mean, we're we're in the clinical research phase, and you know, Maps is sort of the pinnacle of that, and that's sure. that's where I look. But it doesn't seem like it's moving that fast. Sure. So I think you really have two parts of the equation, and the first is the educational piece, right? You're taking a historically taboo um, substance or substances, really, that have been portrayed in mainstream media over the last three, four, five decades, you know, as these radical hallucinogenic hippie drugs that are going to turn you, you know, a psychopath for the rest of your life. That's not true, but educating the general public on the therapeutic effects as well as the safety profiles, which are significantly better than, you know, the vast majority of, of the pharmaceuticals that are currently available is an uphill battle and it's going to take time, money, efforts, collaboration, and ultimately really strong data and results and good players that are that are you know taking place in the administration of these drugs. The second limiting factor that I think is going to be a slow rollout as well is addressing some of the scalability issues that requires very unique infrastructure to actually administer these different treatments. And most notably is the half-life, right? You're looking at extremely long and extended half-lives for the known psychedelics. So you know, MDMA, six to 10 hours, you know, requires a significant amount of man hours to, to be um, applied towards a single treatment. Additionally, psilocybin carries a long half-life. LSD carries the longest half-life up, upwards of, of 12 hours, right? These are very hard to, to scale for one, but also requires a very unique infrastructure. So they're not applicable in the general therapy setting or a therapist office or the corner doctor's office, right? Once you can address those problems, which we're act actively doing at Midas and, and there's a number of other companies looking at controlling the delivery times, uptake times, half-life times, et cetera, to make them much more conducive in the traditional corner doctor's office or you know your, your, your physician's office, your therapist's office that can really increase where patients have access to these different treatments, but also allows many more physicians, psychotherapists, you know, traditional therapists to actually provide this as a treatment. So when that happens, it's going to be much more a part of the everyday conversation, right? Instead of them looking, oh, just to their go-to SSRIs, they're going to say, we also have this other option that we can do here that I'm comfortable with that we do, and it's been very successful in a number of patients, right? So there's going to be a supply and demand issue for sure, and it's more so going to be related to the therapists and the trained professionals that actually 
know how to administer these different treatments and provide it, and also the platforms where they can actually you know, receive that. But again, as time goes along and the second generation of more refined drug comes out to market, I think that that curve will continue to, to increase and ultimately will you know, hopefully shift completely over to this new form of treatment. Sure. Interesting. Josh, I have to ask, just because uh, our audience is all investors, and this is the question that people are going to ask me. So the company has 239 million shares outstanding. Um, most recent quarter reported a four cents per share loss. I understand that de drug development companies are often uh, required to lo lose a lot of money before they get to the finish line. But I think it's important to give CEOs like yourself a chance to explain to my viewers why there's so many shares outstanding and the company's still losing money. What, what, is, what would you say to them to make them investors in your company? Yeah, sure. So I think what you want to look at is probably market cap as it pertains to market size, addressable market size. So a, a favorable report that they can reference uh, was put out by a well-known analyst in Elmer Pierce. He's a PhD. He's at um, Roth Capital. He came out with a $3 price target. And really what that predominantly was focused on is only our lead initiative, which is a phase two, three seamless clinical study that's a partnership with Johns Hopkins addressing smoking secession utilizing psilocybin. And, and what we're showing in the efficacy rates that are coming out of that study are over three to five X what's currently available of, you know, Chantix or um, a nicotine patch which are, with a much safer drug. It's a much more effective drug. When you look at the addressable market, it's projected to be 64 and a half billion by 2026, right? So that report gave us 0.5% of the overall addressable market, right? So, you know, given the upside potential of one of our drugs being successful, you're looking at a multiple dollar stock, right? At bare minimum, these are blockbuster drug potentials. And again, we have many more drugs in the pipeline that we're currently developing that all carry similar potential, right? So the upside, and you know, it's also very important to note that we're not shooting in the dark here, right? We have incredible clinical data that's showing that we're on the path to be very successful and we have a very high likelihood of being successful. So, you know, the road to get there in any drug development, um, you know, generally speaking is a long, long road. It's also important to note where we're at in our drug development. You know, we believe that we'll have a drug on the market by 2024, which is incredibly short um, in the overall you know, period of, of traditional drug development. So, you know, for us, you know, we don't we don't pay attention necessarily to current market price. We look at what we're addressing and obviously, you know, focus on, on how we get there. And we think that we have a very, very clear path to get there um, and the right partners and infrastructure to do so. You bet. That's a great response. And it's a great, uh, great opportunity. I, I'm so excited about the psychedelics. Josh, we're going to leave it there for now, but we will come back to you in due course. And I thank you for your participation today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. You bet. Bye for now. All right. So let's take a look at Midison's performance in terms of financial performance. And we'll take a quick look at capital structure. Company has 238 million, uh, 686,000 shares outstanding. Most recent quarter reported a loss of four cents per share. Uh, which a year ago was five cents per share. So the financial performance of the company gets a D, which stands for developmental. In other words, there's no expectation of revenue, significant revenue, uh, because the company is in the development phase of primarily uh, drugs associated with psychedelics. So investment, an investment in medicine is a speculation on their ability to succeed in the future. In terms of cash, they've got lots of cash, over $7 million in cash as of June 30th. So don't doesn't look like they're going to be needing to go to the market anytime soon. And uh, let's take a look at insider activity. The largest shareholder of the, among the insiders is the CEO, Josh Barch, which is always a good sign. <laughs> Highly incentivized to stick. And he's not a seller of stock. The last time he exercised some options was back in 2017, uh, which he sold in 2020. 
So um, he looks like he's a long-term holder. His uh, position cost him 10 cents a share here for 30 million. Um, he's got a whole bunch of options, but that's normal. So um, capital structure, let's take a look at prior sales here. 7 million in cash, as I said, 486,000 in debt, nothing major. Um, in 2020, last year, they issued 17 million shares uh, to acquire Midison Group at a deemed cost of 7 cents a share. They issued 28 million shares to acquire Trellis, which was the Oregon-based cannabis company that they're now divesting of. 52 million shares, or sorry, 50, yeah, 52 million shares at a deemed value of 5 cents for private placement. That's not the best news. Don't like to see nickel shares out there. Yeah, so financial performance is developmental. Capital structure, I'm going to give that a D as well because it's just got a whole lot of shares out. It's trading around in the 36 cent range. Um, you know, if it creates a billion dollar blockbuster drug, then... Uh, that could all look really negligible in the future, but uh, for now it's, it's, uh, it's a high risk investment and it's speculative. Well, you know, you know what, I, I mean, for, for a one year chart, we've got a, we're, we're sort of range bound where if you look at the, those, those moving average lines that, that are in there, it's in the center sort of going sideways. I mean, a year ago we were at around, you know, 45 cents. If you look at the thick white line, uh, back in uh, March, and here we are today, and we're around 43, 42 cents. So, you know, I say in a, in a year's time, we've had we've had some good good range. However, uh, you know, we're sort of back and forth here. So I say I say it's it's range bound, which is you know a good thing. I guess this is a pretty revolutionary kind of company, or at least that's my guess. And I would say that this is ba this is a basing pattern at this stage, a basing pattern. I'd like to, I, what I'd like to see is the stock gradually moving over fifty cents, and here we yep. are right now about thirty four. Uh, you know, if, if I owned it at thirty four and I got to fifty, I'd probably be inclined to sell it. And yet, you know, if this is if this is uh, where the world's going, then I, I expect that we're people are looking for much more than a a double in a stock like this. You know, you'd really need to see volume, I think, seem to uh, uh, accelerate. I see there's a volume bar at the bottom here. We've had some good volume back when that when the analyst, you see, but look at the spike in volume there. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, it, it, it sort of ran out of gas. So I, I think now if, if you can, if it can hold in here, okay, which is quite a bit higher than where it was in June, uh, the June, I think, what the low was right around 22 and a half or something like that, 23 cents. And here we are quite a bit higher, maybe mm -hmm. a third higher. So, you know, we got to have, we, got, we can't go really back, keep going back to the same. You need to see higher lows, you know, to get some kind of trend established. But, but yeah, I mean, look, it looks like it's a basic pattern. Uh, uh, I don't think anybody's really made any money on this. Well, look. It, it's 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 not it's it's going sideways. It's base building a base, and I'm I suspect uh, you know shareholders are waiting for uh, a bullish bullish news. It's gonna it's gonna be a challenge. I think I you know I, I you know I don't I I mean James and I have talked about the company. It's basing. So as long as it's basing, you know what you got you got an opportunity. But would, would I step into a basing situation? You know I I probably like to see. That 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 solid line in the center at around uh, forty two. I'd like to see that starting to turn up, and right now it looks like it's starting to look like it's flattening out.